is all but one all alone smoking my last cigarette I said where you been he said ask anything where were you Catalyst, you mind standing with us? We're going to sing a few songs together, but let's pray to get started. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the fact that no matter where we are in life, you can come and you can find us. You will pick us up and you will carry us forward. I pray, Lord, that you use this time as we sing these songs together, that you would bind us together as your people. We would draw us into you. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. I got a 
it's greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power. today it talks about how God's love reigns how he calls for God's love to rain down on us so let's sing this song together as we get going called it says holy holy is the Lord
God, we thank you this morning. God, I thank you for who you are. And I thank you that you are a God of joy and happiness. God, I thank you that you're a God of comfort and peace. God, this morning I just pray that you would come in close. I pray that you would wrap your arms tightly around us as a church today. God, I thank you for what you've done in our lives. I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this church and these people. I am forever blessed. I pray that you would be with us today. I pray that you would be with Levi. God, I pray that you would help him teach and preach boldly what you've laid on his heart. God, I thank you for him. I thank you for his obedience to you. God, I pray that you would be with us in the days to come. I know that you will take care of us because that is what you do and that is what you've always done. I thank you for your provision. I thank you for the way that you work in our lives. That when we look back, we can see your hand of goodness and protection. God, I thank you for who you are even when it hurts sometimes. I thank you for the deepness of relationship that we have with this church. God, I thank you for the way we love so much so that it hurts. <laughs> I pray that, that we, as we go out this week, we would continue to love hard. God, that as a church body, we would love each other, we would love our families, we would love our community. God, that's what you've called us to do. God, I pray that you would be with us the rest of this day. I pray that everything that is said and done points right back to you. Love you so much this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. Buenos dias. Good to see you guys. I hope everybody got a Beaker Mini on the way in. This is where you get some good information. Let me draw your attention, guys, to a couple of things. Uh, if you have a team that's graduating from high school, be sure and let Jonathan know we're going to have graduation Sunday next Sunday, June the 8th. So be sure and let Jonathan uh, know that. And don't forget our t-shirt contest. If you uh, go on vacation, dress up in a Catalyst t-shirt, get a creative picture taken, and you win a prize at the end of the summer. So, And we also have new t-shirts that are going to be uh, they're for sale out in the uh, lobby. After the service, there will be somebody there to take your order. So get yours in quickly. And then if you are members of the youth group, be sure and remember tonight is a pool party. So uh, the address is here in the Beaker Mini. Just Google it and uh, show up there from 6 to 8. If you guys would, open up your Beaker Mini all the way to the end where we have the tear-off portion, which we do in fun and creative ways. Last week we did the slow tear. Today we're going to do the fast tear. As fast as you can tear it off. Now the first service was awful. So you guys, I'm counting on you to bring the level of excellence up a little bit. On the count of three, as fast as you can tear it off. One, two, three. That's it! You guys need to come to the early service and show them how it's done. All right. If you'll look over the tear-off section, there's a couple of check boxes that you can read for yourself, but we always emphasize prayer. Let us know if we can pray for you. Uh, we send out emails every week so that we can uh, pray for the church and what's going on. Sensitive stuff, you can mark confidential, so the pastors are the only ones that will see that. But please let us know how we can pray for you. And if you will flip it over, there's a place to put your name and who all came with you. First-time guest, if you'll give us maybe just a name and an email address, we do not stalk or hound you. We just want to say thank you for coming. So if you will uh, take that. And uh, you can also check in on Facebook if you like to do that. But we just want to know that you were here. But take this, and there's a Connect and Tithe box there in the back of the room that you can put your Beaker Mini uh, information card in on your way out. Now, kiddos, you ready for the lab? Our elementary age kids will make their way out. And while they're making their way out, stand up and say hello to someone next to you.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Oh, good. I won't make you say it again. Hey, um, for those of you that were not here last week, and maybe you're not on Facebook, or you're new, and you're, you're not into social media connected with the church, um, how, do, how do I do this without like feeling like I'm dropping a bomb again? Uh, I resigned last week as the pastor of Lead Catalyst, effective the end of June, and so if you're just hearing this now, or if you saw it on Facebook and thought it was some kind of a cruel joke last week, uh, I apologize, because we got a lot of those texts. Is this a joke? Are you messing with us? And, uh, and so I'm not going to get into all of that today. There is a, a seven-minute video uh, on YouTube that has been viewed almost 500 times. I'm not real sure how I feel about people have watched that video 500 times. I don't know if some of you are like, hey, we need to get him out of here sooner. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's get this view count up. But um, what I do want to say is this. I want to say to you that over these last seven years, Heather and I knew that God has done something special. We did not really understand the depth of what he had done until this week when we began to receive text messages and emails, uh, private messages on any social media platform that you can imagine, uh, from you, from people in the community, from people in other states that sent us notes of encouragement and retold us your stories uh, of what God has done. And to that, we say thank you, because... Um, it's been such an incredible blessing. We, we had folks who've been in ministry a long time say, be prepared, there could be some, some backlash because uh, people may feel like you are abandoning them. But time and time again, at every turn, folks said, we are going to miss you terribly, but we feel like this is right. And so to pastor a group of people who, apart from each other, continue to say the same thing over and over and over again, it's affirming, it's humbling, and um, it's meant the world to us. So if you have sent us something and we haven't responded, or I haven't responded, I'm sure Heather responded to you right that minute, but <laughs> I'm, I'm behind, and so I, I will get to each, each private message, and I want to say thank you. It's been an incredible blessing, and I would say this to you. I told Heather, I said, I haven't really uh, struggled with discouragement over the last five years, but if people would just tell people how they really feel about them, it would make all the difference in the world. I, I mean, if you appreciate someone, write them a note and, and tell them how much you appreciate them. Don't wait until there's some situation. You guys have been good to do that to me. I get messages on a regular basis. Thank you so much for what you said today. And I'm like, I, I didn't even say that. God did something magical because I didn't even say those words. But do it with somebody else, somebody that you appreciate. Let them know what they mean to you. It makes all the difference. Well, we are in a series uh, called Name That Tune, and so if you're just joining us, well, we're on our way out, and there's going to be a, a new series coming, but what we've done is, is taken a look at some of the Psalms from the book of Psalms, and so the, the 150 chapters that are, that are in the book of Psalms, the, they were put together, they were called a Psalter, they were like a hymn book, and, and it was put together when God's people were living in exile in Babylon several thousand years ago. And so they would gather together and they would sing these songs. Somebody from uh, the priestly tribe would lead the singing and they would, they would say, we're going to sing from the Psalter and they would name the song and, and they, they would have many of these memorized. Uh, even as children, they would have the whole book of Psalms memorized. And so they would sing these songs together and, and these are songs that, that form and shape thoughts and behaviors. They, they formed and shaped thoughts and behaviors back then and they still do the same thing today. And we've had a lot of fun in this series. Like in our, our opening sequence, the very first week, we kind of just played Name That Tune, right? As soon as you recognized the tune that, that was being played, you called it out. Uh, we, we talked about how some songs cause us to feel or emote uh, certain things, or we play certain music when we feel a certain way, or if we hear music, it makes us feel a certain way. We have talked about how some songs are very singable. And so last week we played several songs back to back, karaoke style, the most singable songs that have ever been written. And you guys were amazing. You may think about a choir after I leave. I'm just saying, because I think I heard, don't, don't. <laughs> Some of you are like, yes, I've always wanted a choir at Catalyst. There's not room. There's no room for a choir. All right. All right. There we go. 
just being passive, passively, aggressively clear there, right? So we're going to do something a little bit different today. I want us to look at song, a, a song that we, we don't like. And that those songs are out there, songs that, that come on the radio or they, you, you happen to be in a place where you're, you're listening and you cannot get your hand to the, the radio fast enough. It just comes on, you're like, Ugh, boom, and it's like the next preset. Or you will listen to music in a language that you don't even understand before you will listen to that song, right? It's like mariachi band. I don't understand what they're saying, but that's better than the song that's on 1029, right? I've done that. I'm like, oh, save me. They're, they are out there. And so everybody in this room has songs that they don't like except Jonathan. I gave him, <laughs> I gave him an assignment this week. I said, Jonathan, I want you to tell us the three songs that like, you dislike most in all the world. And he comes back, he's like, I couldn't really think of any. I'm like, what? I'm like, did you think about it? Because I mean, there has to be some music out. There's terrible music that has been recorded, dude. I don't know if his musical palette is just so advanced that he doesn't mess with the underling. I don't know. I don't know what happened. But luckily, the Rolling Stone has put together, the magazine has put together the worst songs that have ever been produced. And we were able to put three of them together, and some of you will be slightly offended by the first one, I'm sure. So here we go. Let's roll these three songs. I'm proud of you for all keeping your seats. The first service was like, ugh. You guys are all like, ah. They were like, ugh. I thought they were going to bomb it. Can you even listen to this song without thinking of that movie? I just fall over the side. <laughs> yeah. So about a month ago, this thing came out on Facebook. And it said, these are the friends that you need to delete. And you hit the button, and it listed all your friends who had liked the Nickelback page. And it was like, wipe them out. <laughs> Some of you were on that page. It was like, just get rid of this friend. They like Nickelback. Some of you are like, I really like that first song. Well, the Rolling Stone didn't, right? The Macarena, what is that? That's when they can't get anybody out on the dance floor at the wedding, right? And it's like the go-to, oh, yeah, I know that one, right? I mean, we can all get out there and act like we know what we're doing. And then oh, the Titanic song by Celine Dion. All right, so the Rolling Stone had those. I'm going to be honest with you. I've been honest with you for seven years. There are certain worship songs that I don't like. You're like, seriously? Really? And sometimes we even sing them, right? <laughs> I don't get a pick. Like, eh, don't like that one, eh, don't like that one, right? This one's a little bit older. I think part of it was, I just don't like the band Third Day. Sorry, Third Day. I, I know you watch my podcast all the time. But, um, all right, here we go. This, they, they made this song, what's it called? I'm Used Daily. Oh, whatever. All right, let's play this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right? You're like, you cannot do that in the church. You can't make fun. Hallelujah. I got like four weeks left. What are you going to do? Oh, I look out on my oh. Even, like, even like right now, I'm just like. Hallelujah. And some of you are like, that is my most favorite ever. This one we sang like as recently as what, five, six weeks ago? Three weeks in a row? Not that like, I was counting or anything. goodness that there are just certain songs that like you're like but that was one of my favorites you can't like bash a song that Jonathan did I can I can't I just I don't like them and I, I finally told Jonathan on that one I was like dude like I can like get into the lyrics but I it just never fits like into the set like like we'll sing like a rock song and then it's like the Backstreet Boys showed up or something like I'm like and he's like well I know a day I'm like no no was that in sync yeah sorry in sync so 
So sometimes we have these songs that, that just, they're not our favorite, right? And sometimes, if I'm being really honest, I come across in Scripture that isn't my favorite. I read it. I struggle with it. It rubs me the wrong way. It seems like pie in the sky, wishful thinking. And a lot of times I'm tempted and guilty of just breezing past it because it seems so far off and disconnected from where I am. And that's just honesty. You can't say these things. Well, I have for seven years and I will today. There are certain scriptures that are tough to read. And I'm tempted to just blow on by them. And today, the, the song, the psalm that we're going to look at is one of those for me. It's, it's Psalm 68. And if we were transported back to being God's people in exile in Babylon, and Jonathan was the, the worship pastor, and he came and said, hey, we're going to sing Psalm 68 today. I would probably just be over it. Not my favorite. Not my favorite. But you know what? What I have learned is that just because a song isn't my favorite, just because the scripture isn't my favorite, doesn't mean that I have the right to not engage and participate with it. When we sing songs here that aren't my favorite, I don't stand on the front row with my arms crossed in some kind of a hissy fit rebellion, right? I told you I didn't like that song, Frank, right? I don't do that. It's important that we sing the songs and that we engage with Scripture, no matter how much it rubs us the wrong way sometimes. So this psalm has 35 verses, and I'm going to read the first 10 and the last three. Psalm 68, may God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. But the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you, God, went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one in Sinai, before God, the one of Israel. You gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance, your people settled in it. And from your bounty, God, you provided for the poor. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord, to him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens, who thunders with mighty voice, proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the heavens. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Father, would you be with us? In these moments, would you allow these words to read us more than we read them? Would you continue to transform us from the inside out? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Pastor, leave, what, what is it? Why don't you like this one? Well, just upon an initial reading, I would have to say that there's just a bit of a disconnect for me, for starters, I'm not big on God blowing people away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. You're like, yes, but that is justice. Yes, but that's hard for me to read and say, yeah, get them. It's easier for me to focus on the grace and the mercy side of things than to read something that says, blow them away like smoke, melt them like wax. I'm like, yeah. I know that happened in the early church with Nero, right? He literally said, fire to Christian. Like, hey, hey. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, personally. Then when I read the whole psalm, it can begin to sound like the evildoers are, are going to, to like get what's coming to them now, right? And so this isn't going to be on the screen, but just listen to this. This is verses 21 through 23. 
Surely God will crush the heads of his enemies, the hairy crowns of those who go on in their sin. And Ashley Norfleet actually did a little bit of research for me and, and helped me, because in the first service, I was like, that says hairy crowns. And I didn't study that, but it basically referred to the folks who uh, grew their hair out and would not cut it until they had been victorious in battle. Thank you very much, right? I just think it's cool that Scripture says hairy crowns, right? <laughs> Don't see those in the Miss America pageant. <laughs> the Lord says, I'm way off track. <laughs> the Lord says, I will bring them from Bashan. I will bring them from the depths of the sea that your feet may wade in the blood of your foes while the tongues of your dogs have their share. That is one of our favorite scriptures to use at night with our kids before we put them to bed, right? I mean, it's just like, hey, have sweet dreams. The Bible says this. I just read that, right? And it's like, it sounds like there's going to be imminent justice. And I guess sometimes, as much as I don't want God to blow people away like smoke or, or melt them like wax, sometimes within me, if I'm honest, there, there's something that I do want to see somebody get what they have coming to them. Because, man, I mean, there's crooks and jerks and cheaters and shysters out there. Be careful when you say shysters in public, right? That one can get away from you. But they continue to crook and jerk people around. They cheat people. And it seems like they, they don't get what's coming to them. So sometimes I read this, and it's like, God's going to blow them away. And then they're going to get what's coming to them. And I'm like, I don't want to blow them away, but I kind of want to see them like, get a little bit of what's coming to them. Like, I want to see it. And I'm not just talking about like, the, the dregs of society, the, the, the lowest of the low that are involved in like mob and black market activity. I'm talking just about the people that we encounter on a regular basis, the people that we work with, that cheat, that lie, that fudge the numbers, that place blame where blame is not supposed to be, right? That's where it hits a little bit closer to home. People who always seem to be cheating and getting ahead and never getting caught. Do you know this kind of people? I don't want names, right? This is going to be on the internet. But sometimes there's something within me where I'm like, I want, I want to see a little, bit of, a little bit of justice. I want to see it. And so I read this and I think, ah, oh, man, this just, there's a disconnect. And the last thing, this is one of my biggest pet peeves just in life, not even with Scripture. I have a really hard time dealing with arrogant people. We live authentically. We live real. We try to live humbly. And so when I encounter someone that, is always wanting to talk about themselves and me and my blah, blah. I'm just like, you're talking to me. I'm staring right through you. Arrogance is something that I just have a disdain for. And so sometimes when I read scripture like this, and it sounds like God's people are arrogant. In my mind, I see him kind of walking around with a megaphone, shouting about how big and bad their God is and how their God can and will beat up your God. It's just... I'm just being honest with you. Sometimes it's just a foreign concept. It seems so distant from where I am. Like, was that it? Is that all you got for us today? Yeah, let's pray. No, that's not all I got. That's not all I've got. One of the things that I've found when I'm not feeling a certain scripture, especially a psalm, something written in lyric form, is I find that I'm, I'm reading it through a filter. I'm reading it through the filter of being middle class, of being a white dude living in an age with crazy technology. I read it through the filter of nobody trying to take me captive, destroy my city, kill me, or kill my family. Because so far in my 38 years, none of that has happened. Nobody has raided the town I lived in. Nobody has burned down all the houses of worship. Nobody has made us exiles. I haven't had to wander through the desert for 40 years wondering when the next attack is going to come from and whether we need to be prepared to defend the attack or if we need to go on the offensive. I read it through the filter of being a free citizen in one of the most powerful countries on earth, a country where we value individualism over communalism. I'm not even close to being in the situation that these folks we're in because this is this is a song about their wilderness wanderings, a 
a time when they were down and out, when the manna, the bread-like substance that is like, what is it, fell from the sky, when they went days without water and they had to hit a rock with a stick and God would provide the water, when they, when they were down and out, when they were in the gutter, when they had no permanent home. And so as I begin to read this and reread it and say, God, what in the world is in here for us? I discover that there's a couple of verses, <laughs> five and six, that say this. That with all the other stuff, kind of just went right over it. But it basically says that, that God, <laughs> this God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, says, is God in his holy dwelling. At the core, at the very seat of who God is. He's a father to the fatherless, a defender of the widows. God sets the lonely in families. He leads the prisoners with singing. Man, it begins to hit me. This isn't a song for uh, a white middle-class dude living in Raleigh, Texas, that, that doesn't compare to these people have a care in the world or a concern in the world. This is a song for the lowly. This is a song for the marginalized. This is a song for the down and out. Right after the first verses of this invitation to praise, verses 5 and 6 make it clear that the God of Israel is not merely a mighty warrior who, who scatters his enemies for the fun of it or for the thrill of battle or for the purpose of showing off. One pastor said, rather, God fights for the vulnerable and the dispossessed, orphans and widows, the homeless, the captives. And when we read this, in spite of its militant character and its victorious confidence, this is not the spirit. This is not the heart of this song. There's a self-understanding and a self-description in this psalm's measure that belies such a reading. The use is assigned to the power of the Lord as divine warrior are crucial. The God who dwells in his holy habitation is victor, is father of orphans and protector of widows, who gives the desolate a home and liberates prisoners. This is a song that belongs to the lowly, who in the midst of the powers of this world remember the past and hope for the future and hope for the victory of God. And so sometimes, instead of just blowing over a piece of scripture, blowing over a song that it, at first it doesn't necessarily resonate deep within me, what I've learned is we do ourselves a disservice when we just skip over and we don't dig in and figure out what's going on and who the song is written for. Can't do it. <laughs> Can't filter everything through me, 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 me. Because you see, a song that belongs to the lowly, the homeless, the poor, the widow, that encourages them to remember that God is on their side, I like <laughs> a song like that. My heart resonates with that. It is a song that, that I want to sing, and it's a song that I don't want to sing alone. It's a, it's a song that I want to sing with God's people. There's an archbishop, his name's Oscar Romero. He said, only those who practice divine compassion can rightly claim that God is on our side. There is a criterion for knowing whether God is close to us or far away. All those who worry about the hungry, the naked, the poor, the disappeared, the tortured, the imprisoned, about suffering, any suffering human being, they are close to God. Sometimes we need to spend time. We can't just give a cursory reading and blow it off and move to something that moves us a little more. We have a God whose heart is for the hurting, for those who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, who are broke, whose spirits are broken. And it's not just Jesus in the New Testament, it's God the Father in the Old Testament. And then we look ahead and we say, who did Jesus, who did Jesus spend his time with? 
He spent his time with a bunch of not good enoughs, the B teamers, the JV, the, not even the JV, the ones that couldn't even make the JV, right? A bunch of castaways that all the other rabbis said, you're not good enough. He picks them up. Who do they walk around ministering to? The broke, the blind, the lame, the poor. This is who God has a heart for. And if we are going to partner with him, if we want our heart to look anything like his heart, these are the songs that we have to sing. And I told the first service, whether you know it or not, in these seven years, these are the songs that we have sung together. At the core of who we are, we say, you're down, you're low, the other churches have told you you can't go there. Well, this is a place for the down and out. Sometimes we've sung songs for you because you were so broken, you couldn't even sing them for yourself. For seven years, this is who we are. And you know what? It's bigger than me. It's bigger than anybody. On the, This is who Catalyst is. We're the ones that sing the songs. For the down and out, the broken, the hurting, the ones who have given up on church and never gave church a chance. At our core, it's who we are and who we will continue to be. Let's pray. Father, oh, forgive me. <laughs> forgive me when in my arrogance I begin to read these ancient songs through my filter, through my lens, and I just seem like it seems like there's no disconnect. But Father, when we realize that this world is full of people who, who don't know where the next cup of clean water is going to come from. They don't know when the next good meal is going to come. That there are widows, that there are orphans, those who are wrongfully imprisoned, those who are left without a family, who need to know that there is a God who is on their side, who will one day come and set things right, whether we have the opportunity to see it or not. God, forgive me, forgive us. When in our arrogance, God, I have no other word for it. The thing that I despise the most that I see in myself at times, that in our arrogance we miss the beauty of a God whose heart beats for the down and out. God, I thank you for a church. I thank you for a church who says there is room for everyone at our table. We don't care about your past or your hurt. We serve a God who's come through in the past and will come through in the future. Maybe not in the exact way that we can dream up, but in only a way that you, our creative God, can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's not a better way to end this service than to sing for the poor and the powerless. Stand with me as we sing together.
catalyst. May we be a people who continue to beat this drum, to sing this song, to tell the people around us who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death that there is a God whose heart breaks for them, who is with them. And may we be the people of God who come alongside as God conforms our hearts into his heart. Go in his grace and in his peace. We'll see you next week.